Hello and welcome to my channel. Um, this video is a difficult one for me to make. I have been trying to make this video for over five years. I know I haven't had this channel for five years. How could I have been trying to make this video for five years? Sorry, there's something on my glasses. Um, I have never had the courage to make this video. It is something that I've been afraid to make. Um, I've been afraid to lose the love and support of my family and friends. I've been afraid and ashamed thinking that I would be sued or I wouldn't be able to afford a lawyer if I were sued. I would, I was afraid I would lose relationships, excuse me, with partners. I was afraid I would lose jobs. I was afraid people would hate me. I was afraid nobody would watch it. I was afraid it would get banned. I was, I was afraid of so many different things, rational and irrational. I was afraid of judgment. I was afraid of myself. I was afraid of saying the words out loud. I was afraid of so many different things. I didn't have the courage and I felt like I might not even have the support, if that makes sense. But then I had a conversation recently with my boyfriend and I told him, I think I might be ready to make this video and I've been thinking about making this video. And he said, well, what are some of your fears? And I told him and he said, well, if you need a lawyer, I'll help you pay for one. I'll support you. He said he thought that the video would be healing and he thought that I'm brave and I should do what I think is right and that he believes in me. And just those words from somebody really meant so much to me and kind of reaffirmed all the things that I was thinking about myself. And I am sorry, this schputz on my glasses is driving me cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. It's really driving me crazy. I have to fix it. I am so sorry. I just have to be able to see better. There we go. Anyway, um, so yeah. Um, so here we go. There is a disclaimer though. The following video is going to be about sexual abuse, incest, recovery, and hope. It may be triggering to some people who have experienced this kind of trauma in their life. I would suggest that you click off the video if you feel that you may experience harm from this video. But if you feel that you can withstand the content, I encourage you to continue. This video will serve to educate, I hope, will serve to educate and be healing for those who watch it. There is no judgment no matter where you fall. If you need to click off this video, I completely understand. I myself have had to click off similar videos because I was not in an emotional state to be able to handle them. So there is no judgment or shame in having to leave. On the same token, if you are able to stay, thank you, one, for taking your the time and your time to be here. And also, thank you so very much for supporting this video. And as you can see, I'm tripping over my tongue. I am incredibly nervous doing this. This is my fourth time trying to make this video. I am trying to do it right. I want this to be all inclusive. I want you to know that my story is from a female perspective, but that this happens to males as well. I want to talk about several different things and different aspects. I will be talking about my story specifically for the most part, but there are some things that I want to speak about um, beforehand. The first thing that I want to say is that all people that are victims of sexual harassment or sexual abuse are equally as important. Men, women, children, transgender, 
people, all human beings are equally as important and should be given the same amount of respect and care. So please, please, please be respectful in your thoughts and comments and words with them, both in person, online, on the phone, on Skype, wherever you are. Please think before you speak. That is so very important. Why am I saying that? Well, a lot of people are coming forward and there are a lot of judgments that are happening. What do I mean by that? Well, um, a lot of people are saying, well, why haven't you come forward before now to a lot of people that are coming forward since this this whole movement has kind of happened with the Me Too hashtag and so on. Um, some people are too afraid or too ashamed. There are a lot of stigmas around sexual abuse and it is too hard and too difficult and too painful to speak publicly. Um, that is a reason and it is a legitimate reason and do not try to take the legitimacy out of someone's reasoning. It is not fair and it is unkind and it is not your place to do so. Um, Another thing is the stigma around it, the stigma that comes from people being so judgmental and hard on each other, the fear of rejection from other people, the unkindness of other people. People are unkind and cruel to one another, and that can be a big enough reason. And then there's the severe trauma of the abuse itself and what it can do to an individual and to their lives. And why would someone want to relive that publicly? Some people will go to their deathbed never having spoken of it or talking to it, uh, to another person about it. So judgment about it is just, there's just no place in this world for it, um, in my personal opinion. And I really think that you should take care with others on this topic and a multitude of other topics. But this is our main focus for this video. And, and um, that is where I stand on that particular issue. Um, another issue that I think is not spoken about um, enough that I want to address and is part of my experience and I don't know if other people have experienced it or not. Um, I am a bigger person as you can tell. Um, weight became part of my trauma. Um, I went from being 69 pounds to 96 pounds. It is in my baby book that is over there. Um, it is documented. Um, I do not have it over here with me. Sorry, I didn't have the foresight to bring that over. Um, but the reason that I'm bringing this up is that weight was a way that I thought I could be unattractive. If I'm unattractive and ugly and people are making fun of me, and I'm icky, boys won't like me. If boys don't like me and they think I'm gross, they won't touch me. They won't hurt me. They won't be mean to me. Sorry, these glasses are bothering me. I have to clean them later. I'm going to take them off. Sorry about that. They won't be mean to me. They won't abuse me. The problem with that is that it doesn't insulate you the way you'd hoped in many cases. There are a lot of men who will give you that reaction, who will say that you're nothing and you're worthless and you're disgusting and you're, you're you know, an amoeba, you know, you're scum for your weight. And I do hear those kinds of things on a regular basis. I am looked at like I'm a freak at the zoo quite often. 
for my weight. Even physicians have looked at me that way. However, it also backfires that plan. Because when you're in third grade and you're the only girl that has boobs and a bra, the boys are going to stare at you and you're going to get felt up on the way to the bathroom, even at Catholic school. And when you do jumping jacks, the boys are going to notice and it's going to be embarrassing and you're going to hate yourself and you're going to hate that they'll tell you that you're ugly and you're fat and you're awful and they hate you but they're still gonna gawk at your boobs when you have to do jump rope or jumping jacks and they're still gonna fill you up in the bathroom and you're still gonna feel worthless and you're still gonna hate yourself but they're still gonna like you like that and you're not gonna understand and you're still gonna get boyfriends and you're gonna have people that are going to want to do things with you but they're not going to want to date you because you're okay to do stuff with but you're not okay to be seen with or love and on that topic um, let me find it really quick I did a poem in my teenage years about that um, this video is so going to get me flagged. So going to get me flagged. Um, sorry, I didn't... I didn't intend on reading this particular one, but... Let me find it. Oh, shoot. Um, I will find it, I promise. It's in here. It's either in this one or another one. I know I read it really often this particular summer. This was my main go-to one. I will find it. Goodness gracious, maybe it's in this other one. I had two that I read from quite frequently. Oh yeah, maybe it's in this one. That was a terrible poem. I have some really bad ones. I didn't think it was in this one, but maybe... Anyway, um, I'm sorry for this video being so out there. Um, I know I read it this summer, so it has to be in here. So 
So it's here somewhere. Always when you want to find something, you can't find it. Isn't that how it goes? Well, anyway, um, let me continue on anyway. Um, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. Anyway, um, so people would want to do horrible, uh, not horrible things, but they would want to do really, you know, sexualized things anyway. And I would have boyfriends anyway, and people would love me anyway, even though I was terribly overweight. And it was a very difficult thing for me to process because it was backfiring. I felt unlovable and ugly and horrible and terrible and gross and disgusting. And yet people were seeing beyond that and seemed to like me anyway. And it was confusing to me. And then other people would say, you know, well, you're okay to be with temporarily, but I don't want to date you. Oh, that's a disgusting thought. You don't know how to process that. And um, I wrote a poem by, about that. And some of the language in this is graphic, and I'm going to warn you about that now. So if you don't want to hear graphic language, um, I would skip ahead about maybe four minutes, two to four minutes, something like that, um, as I am going to read this poem out, and you will not like the language of this poem. Uh, this was written when I was about 17, I believe, um, and this is a real experience that happened to me. It is called Fuckable, Not Lovable. Met you when I was but a child, trying to be all grown up. Friendship I gave to you on a warm, lonely night. Felt, felt for you when nobody else would. You hate girls, but what am I? I'm a girl. Can't you see? Are you so tired of me? You went after my friend. You messed with her head. Then again, you came to me. Make me believe your lies that your fairy stories were real, made my lips yearn for yours. I came to you in the promise of tomorrow, but you wanted to sleep with my mother. You wanted me for your fun to make me your dirty whore. What makes you believe that I would be your whore? You fucked my mattress, couldn't even find my body. You blind, cold Jack the Ripper, ripping away love. Then I could, then I forgive out of kindness. And you dare to tell me that you would fuck me? And then when I told you no, you dare to tell me. Carrie, you realize that you aren't lovable, right? You're just fuckable, not lovable. You're fuckable not lovable. So that experience gave me a bit of a complex that I was fuckable, but I wasn't lovable. So now I had all this weight, right? It wasn't insulating me because I was still apparently attractive enough to be fuckable. So this whole idea that weight was a mechanism to keep guys away had failed. And then I was left with all this weight. Doctors were freaking out. You weigh too much, you weigh too much. And it's a lot easier to put it on than it is to get rid of it. Believe me. And there are eating disorders and other things that are totally topics for a totally different video. But not a lot of people see how weight can be a protection mechanism in sexual abuse. And I really wanted to bring that up in this video because I don't feel like that is brought up a lot. And it doesn't need to be morbid obesity kind of weight. It can, excuse me, it can just be a couple of pounds. Um, 
but I don't think it's discussed very much and I actually had never even considered that that was part of my own situation until a conversation when I was 19 years old with an amazing person who was in my life for only a brief time through an ex-partner of mine and she had said that she knew somebody in her life who experienced a lot of trauma along these lines and who went through something similar and um, I was really touched by hearing that story about that one um, particular person and how um, that happened and it made me think about my own story in my own life and the thing that hit me hardest about that was that one particular girl that friend of hers um, her pain was so deep and so intense that she took her own life and that impacted me so very deeply because this abuse that you suffer in your life stays with you for so long in your life and is so deeply in, ingrained in you and sometimes your suffering is so intense that you do not survive it and people tend to make jokes or make light of it. It is not light. It is heavy and it is dark and sometimes it consumes you and my hope for all of you, if you have suffered from it or you know somebody who has suffered from it, is that you or your loved one is not consumed by their pain like that person was and that they can be on the road to recovery and they can hold on to that hope. And um, that is why I'm making this video for that girl and her memory and for everybody who cannot speak for themselves and for myself because I am finding my voice and my I am finding my power and my courage and my bravery to come forward and to be unafraid and to take back what was taken from me because I think so much is taken from you uh, things that you didn't even know were gone and you discover so much through recovery and healing and it is a process that is lifelong another thing that I want to address before I go into my story and I'm sorry that this video is going to be so incredibly long um, not just because it took me so long to find the, the poem there will be another poem that I will read um, but while I um I talk about this, I'm going to, oh, I had a tissue as a holder, okay, um, anyway, um, not just, um, 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 I have another topic, uh, in addition to my story that I want to talk about, and, um, that is um, I want to discuss um, sexuality in relation to trauma of this type. So you kind of go one of two ways right you and this can change over time right um actually I'm not going to read that poem because as brave as I'm feeling I'm not feeling that brave and maybe at a local poetry reading someday I will read those but I um, am not in this video in this context uh, ready for that um all right so anyway um you can tend to go one of two ways so either you are very very closed off sexually and closed down and shut down and very um not sexual or you are very overtly sexual and overly sexual um, in how you are um, 
as a result. And you might not even realize that in your relationships as you grow older. You might even say, like, you know, I really don't feel like what happened to me when I was younger is really impacting how I'm going as I'm getting older. You might feel really disconnected from that and just say, like, you know, no, that's not really how it's going. You know, I, I'm an adult now. <coughs> I'm not thinking about that, you know, when I'm, you know, doing my adult things as an adult. But it really is kind of seeping into those relationships, into those kinds of things, into the to the things that you're willing to do and how you're willing to do things. And and so on and so forth. It really, really does have a huge impact. And I didn't fully appreciate how much it was seeping into my life and my choices and how things were going and, and stuff. Um, until quite recently, I didn't, I don't think I realized the depth. Um, and not, and I'm not just discovering that in therapy. I think some of those realizations is why I am in currently in therapy because, um, I kind of realized that and I kind of realized that I needed a place to be able to funnel some of the information that I was starting to figure out on my own and I kind of needed to be able to bounce it back off of somebody who would be able to give me constructive feedback on it um, and be able to work through it for my individual situation. And it's going to be very different for each and every person. And I'm not saying that therapy is the right way to go. Some people, medication helps. Some people, therapy helps. Some people, just talking to a friend helps. Some people, running helps. Um, some people, poetry helps. Some people, journaling helps. Um, this was my teenage one. So there's like Dragon Ball Z and Powerpuff Girls, and I think there are like some dinosaurs, and there's a shark, I think there's a praying mantis um, on there, and then we've got like precious moments, and flowers, and me as a 12 year old, like there's some crazy kooky stickers all over here, Disney princesses, and like Frieza, and all sorts of things all over um but yeah like do whatever you know outline is really good for you um to do that so those are the topics that I wanted to talk about for that all right so now now the really difficult part I wrote this out I am going to be reading it. Um, I know that's really different from me and I'm sorry if I'm not looking directly at the camera right if you can tell that I'm reading and I'm kind of looking all over the place I'm sorry about that it's just this is very difficult for me and I wanted to be able to get it right I want this video to be done right I want it to be as inclusive for everybody as possible I know a lot of this is coming from a female perspective, but I want males to feel welcome here. I want you to be able to share your truth here if you feel comfortable. I want you to be able to share your perspective here if you feel comfortable. I want you to know that this is a safe place. I want you to know that if anybody is abusive, I will get rid of their commentary. I want you to know that this is a place where I want to begin healing. I want this to be a place where we can be a community. We can have conversations. We can be just human beings together working stuff out. Um, okay, here we go. I'm from a small town about an hour and a half outside of New York City. It's called Middletown, New York. Um, my family was like anyone else's family. My mother was a stay-at-home mom who adored me and was active in everything I did. All the kids thought that she was the best mom in the world. Um, they loved all the goodie bags that she did and all of the cupcakes that she made for the bake sales and just thought that they wanted to be like in our house. I was an only child and I was spoiled rotten. Um... My father worked hard to provide for us and everyone at school from the moms and the girls thought that he was handsome. Everybody thought that we, was luck that we were lucky to have him. We were the perfect family, only we weren't. There were cracks in our family's china that nobody else saw 
or simply did not want to believe were there. I am the victim slash survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I am a victim slash survivor of incest. It happened on and off from the ages of two until I was 12. The abuse was not just from one person. It was from several people. Some of those close to me that I had known and trusted my entire life, and some were complete and total strangers. It was not simply one type either. My abuse was mental, emotional, and physical. It included, but was not limited to, manipulation, betrayal, lying, sexual assault, molestation, being locked in a dog cage, a version of, a sexual version of Simon Says, renamed for its purposes, being sexually traumatized with a broom handle, being threatened with lighters and cigarettes, and so much more. I am often asked why I did not come forward. Well, when I was 16, I was having night terrors and not sleeping. My granny not noticed that my grades were in the toilet and that I was a wreck. She called the family meeting. My grampy was silent in the corner, visibly uncomfortable. My mother had left the room to take a phone call, and my granny asked me point blank if a certain individual had ever touched me. In a weak voice, I simply said, yes. That sent everything into a flurry of motion. I was pulled out of school that same day. I was then discussed heavily by my entire extended family. I felt as if I were... I were being victimized all over again. I was part of the family gossip mill. I did not appreciate being talked about behind my back in this manner. I did not know what was being said. I knew that their hearts were in the right place, but I felt very uncomfortable. I felt like people that did not know everything and did not understand were making decisions and talking about me without my consent. I was very unhappy. My aunt, who at the time worked in the mental health field, decided that either my mother and I had to call Child Protective Services or that she would. An ultimatum had been set. With that, an appointment was made. At Child Protective Services, the rule is, is that there is supposed to be a male cop and a female social worker that conducts your interview. However, this was not the case for me. I was told that it's supposed to be this way to make you feel more comfortable so you don't feel that any one gender is ganging up on you it keeps you from having flashbacks and makes you feel more comfortable. But on the day that I arrived at Child Protective Services, the woman social worker called in sick and they asked me if I felt comfortable with two males conducting my interview. I was upset and really just wanted the interview to be over with. I didn't want to be there in the first place, so I agreed to conduct the interview anyway. I just wanted to get out of the building. I wanted to be out of there. I didn't want to relive anything. I was 16 years old and just wanted to go back to bed. It was a disaster from the moment that I walked into the room. The cop assigned to my case physically had characteristics that reminded me of the person who harmed me most. He had a cold demeanor and was not particularly kind to me. He was very forceful and made it abundantly clear 
that he wanted me to word everything that I said specifically to state that I was unsure if things happened rather than that they had happened. He wanted me to say things like, I can't quite recall, or I think that happened, or that could have happened, rather than that's what happened, or it went like this, etc. I followed along because it would get me out of there faster. I said as little as possible and did my best to just appease him so I could get out of the room. The social worker looked like he was either afraid of the man or just simply was bored and tired and wanted to get out of there like I did. He looked like a scared rabbit and just let the man strong arm me. He didn't say anything to help me, and it seemed as if everything I said either wasn't good enough or just was annoying to the cop. Apparently, everything that I said meant that there was a statute of limitation on it, and it had expired. But I was told that they would look into it. About a month later, I received a letter from the state of New York telling me in the politest, most eloquent language possible that I was a liar and that none of the things that had been discussed in my interview had actually taken place. That their interview had come up with nothing because individuals had either been deceased, had moved, or my story could not be corroborated because individuals involved outright denied the allegations made. This was unsurprising. I knew that that would be the case, that that would happen. I knew that I wasn't strong enough to deal with it. I knew that people would look at me as an angry teenager. I knew that my word against the word of adults would be taken lightly. I knew that with the information that I had given them, I wouldn't be taken seriously. I knew about the statute of limitations. I knew that it was a pointless venture to go there that day. I knew the fact that there were two men in the room would change things. I knew that the cop had no intention of taking me seriously. I knew that the whole entire thing would end up with that letter. But somehow, having a letter from the state calling you a liar when you knew that what happened to you was the truth was like having it happen all over again. It was like being rejected. It was soul crushing. And yet, at the bottom, there was a little notice saying, that the state was going to foot the bill for me to join a support group for sexually abused teenagers. Go figure. They completely did not believe a word that I said, but they were going to pay for me to go into therapy individually and to join a support group for teenagers, all because of sexual abuse but no sexual abuse had happened because I'm a liar. That makes so much sense. So at 17, I was angry and I was hurt. As you can imagine, I never again or since spoke publicly about what happened to me. Some people within my family said flat out that they loved me but they believed that my claims were for attention or to get out of school. They did not believe the people involved would ever sink so low as to actually do anything at all harmful toward me, let alone the things that they imagined my claims would be. They thought that I just was a mentally unstable teenager who was overly hormonal. People who had known the individual at the center of my abuse have never believed he was capable of it and have always seen him as a good person and believed that it was simply a misunderstanding or a messy situation that they simply did not understand that 
and this has all made me afraid and ashamed to come forward. It was a big reason why I never talked about what happened to me in therapy, with partners, with friends, publicly, etc. It is not the kind of thing that one ever talks about. You keep it to yourself. There is a lot of shame and stigma that comes with it. That was until my late 20s when I confided some of the details to a partner of mine. I thought we would spend the rest of our lives together and I wanted to be upfront with him. However, he was more concerned on how it would impact our sex life than anything else and that made me reevaluate our relationship and his ability to understand and appreciate me and my experience. Then I confided in my next boyfriend. I was sure that we would be together for a long while and I felt that I owed it to him to be transparent. His thought was that perhaps my cancer surgery causing me to be sterilized was a blessing. When I asked him why, he said that this way I could not be tempted to victimize any children of my own in the same way that I was victimized. The fact that he would ever think for a second that I could do that to a child both shocked and sickened me. I had wanted children since I was a child. It was a dream and it was traumatically taken from me due to my cancer. And now he was saying that perhaps it was a blessing from God that I could because I could secretly be a monster like the person who had brutally victimized me. It made me seriously reconsider our relationship and how he saw me. It made me angry but mostly so deeply hurt that anyone, especially someone that I had cared so deeply for, could think something so heinous about me. Needless to say, neither of those relationships lasted. I am now with someone who knows me and supports me. He knows most of what has happened. I am in therapy and I am working through my issues step by step. I'm still having night terrors and working on getting them under control. Sometimes I dream about the memories of what happened and sometimes I dream about my main abuser. But I am happy and proud to say that I no longer have the people involved in my abuse in my life. I wake up each day with the hope that I will overcome and fight through all of these things. I am making this video and breaking my silence. I am taking back my power. I am being honest. This is my story. It is my truth. I am a sexual abuse slash incest survivor. I hope this video is able to do some good in the world and to help someone else out there who might be going through some of these problems with their own life, in their own life. And I hope that it helps you to find your courage to be honest with yourself, with the people in your life. Um, if you have any um, thoughts comments, questions for me about my story, about my life, um, please leave them in the description down below. If you would rather talk to me um, more personally, my contact details will be um, there. And if you would like to talk to somebody um, or reach out to somebody, um, I'm going to leave the link down below to RAIN, which is the Rape Incest um, rape Abuse Incest National Network. Um, please reach out to them. They have a wonderful hotline. Um, they helped me a lot when I was a teenager. I support them whenever I can. Um, it is an amazing organization that does a wonderful, great um, work. I have always believed in them. Um, when I first was in therapy, um, since I am somebody who is very much into reading and information, um, part of my therapy was to learn more about the effects 
of abuse on an individual and so I would get a lot of my information from RAIN. They have wonderful statistics and information and so if you're that kind of person and that will help your healing process, that is a wonderful place to go. But if you just need someone to talk to, their hotline is fantastic. They have volunteers there who either have been through it or have been trained to be able to listen to you and be able to help you and it will help you feel better. There are people willing to listen to you and you do have your voice. Your voice is there and there are people that are willing to listen and who will not judge you or make you feel bad. There are people who will believe you and who will understand you and who will not be unkind to you. And I think that is the main reason that I want to do this video, so that people know that they do have a voice and that there are people there in the world who understand and are there for them. Um, Normally, I say, if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Today, I'm going to say, if this video impacted you, if it touched you, if it moved you, if it helped you, if it inspired you, if it gave you hope, give it a thumbs up. If you are new to the channel, and you have taken something away from the content here on this channel from this video or from a previous video or from a culmination of them, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for your time today. This is the longest video that I've made for this channel. I feel like it was much needed. This is the most difficult video that I have ever made. I am really afraid to upload this video. I am really surprised that I have gotten through it without bawling like a baby. Um, I did not share a lot of information that I know a lot of people would have wanted me to. A lot of people would want me to have given a lot more detail to my story. Um, they would have wanted to know how, um, how, what, where, and especially, specifically, names. And the thing is, is that the people involved know who they are, um, they know where, and they know the what specifically. And for this video, it's not about any of those things. It's about all of the things that have been covered in the way that it's been covered and to me I feel like this video has been done in this way because this is what I needed and this is what I feel best serves all of you and all of us and this is about us and not them and I don't want to make it about them um, the attention is not on them it's on us. Never forget that. Thank you so much for watching and um, being so supportive and so kind. It means the world. And um, if I lose friends or family over this, I truly understand, but were you ever really friends or family to begin with? That is what I ask myself on a daily basis because I feel like those who really love you will love you no matter what and they will accept your honesty and they will accept you good, bad, and indifferent and I am me and this is my story and this is what I have been through and this is me standing up for myself and healing. And those who truly understand and appreciate that are going to be here with me as I move forward. And I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I will see you on Friday for my autumn fashion haul. <laughs> See you then. I'm excited for that video.
not afraid at all of that one. <laughs> all right, see you then. Bye.